G'day. Today I'm going to sit back, laze and use a guest presenter. This is Dr. San Fernando, emergency physician and retrievalist, and he's going to speak to us about non-invasive ventilation in one coffee. Enjoy. Hi everyone, welcome to Emergency Medicine Topics in One Coffee. I'm San Fernando, an emergency physician working in southwest Sydney, and we're going to go through non-invasive ventilation today in the time it takes to have one coffee. So CPAP and BiPAP are two different forms of non-invasive ventilation. But why do we put people on non-invasive ventilation? Well, you can break down the reasoning into two main problems. Firstly, there's ventilatory failure. And this is essentially someone who's been in respiratory difficulty for whatever cause for some time and is now getting tired or is already weak and unable to cope with the respiratory insult they're suffering. Essentially, the forces resisting ventilation are becoming greater than those of respiratory effort. The other reason is a failure of gas exchange. So essentially, this is where your alveolus are full of stuff, and that stuff can be pus or phlegm or fluid or blood or whatever. Or for some other reason, that gas exchange between the alveolus and the bloodstream is compromised. Often, a combination of both of these mechanisms will exist. So how does non-invasive ventilation help us treat these patients? Well, if you close your eyes for a moment and think about an airway that's just full of gunk, non-invasive ventilation can help to prevent further gunk from developing. Uh, it also helps prevent the airways from collapsing, particularly in expiration. And this improves alveolar ventilation and reduces the work of breathing, and also may have some beneficial cardiac effects. The best way to approach a patient who's in respiratory distress is to think about the problem you're trying to fix. So, if the primary problem is hypoxia, then non-invasive ventilation can help by providing CPAP, which is expiratory pressure as well as an in increased inspired oxygen concentration. An example of this would be acute pulmonary edema. In this setting, particularly in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, CPAP can improve movement of alveolar fluid back into the interstitium, increase production of surfactant, which is very important in maintaining alveolar integrity, and hence, improve hypoxia by recruiting, which is opening up those previously collapsed alveoli. BiPAP has been associated with some worse outcomes, so CPAP is recommended in acute pulmonary edema when it exists in isolation. If the primary problem, however, is hypercapnia, that's a high CO2, the solution is to provide an increase in the inspiratory pressure and increase the pressure support. So remember, BiPAP involves both an inspiratory pressure and an expiratory pressure. The expiratory pressure alone is essentially the same as CPAP. And the difference between the inspiratory pressure and the expiratory pressure is the pressure support. BiPAP is great for exacerbations of COPD. Patients benefit from both the CPAP, which is the continuous positive airway pressure, which improves hypoxia, and the inspiratory pressure, which improves ventilation and hence addresses the high CO2, as well as the pressure support, which is the difference between the two, which reduces the work of breathing. To demonstrate how you might use non-invasive ventilation, let's run through a quick case. Now, this is a hypothetical case and this chest X-ray is of a 68-year-old man who awoke with shortness of breath. He has a cardiac background, has a respiratory rate of 40, is sweaty, has SATs of around about 90%, despite having some supplemental oxygen, and he clearly has acute pulmonary edema, as you can see. He is a smoker of many years, but has no documented lung disease. And considering the acuteness of his presentation, it was thought reasonable to commence him on CPAP, starting at around five to 10 centimetres of water and with an FiO2 of around about 
An arterial blood gas is performed about 10 minutes later, which surprisingly shows a PaO2 of 55 and a PaCO2 of 72. Now, potentially, you can also use venous blood gases, but there are many other variables to consider. So to keep this discussion simple, I'm just going to talk about arterial blood gases. So we now have a hypoxic as well as a hypercapnic problem. So changing him over to BiPAP seems appropriate. He started on an inspiratory pressure of 12 centimetres of water and his current expiratory pressure is increased to 6 centimetres of water to address his ongoing hypoxia. As we know, we'll have to turn down his FiO2 to address at least partially his hypercapnia. His FiO2 is turned down to 22%. So now he has an inspiratory pressure of 12 and an expiratory pressure of uh, 6, giving him a pressure support of 6 centimetres of water. His O2 sats improve and his work of breathing decreases initially, but after an hour or so, he looks like he's tiring. Although he's no longer hypoxic, a repeat arterial blood gas shows a CO2 of 75. Now a knee-jerk response will be to increase both his IPAP and his CPAP. But what he actually needs is greater pressure support, which is the difference between the two. And this will help decrease his work of breathing. So what we should do in this situation is decrease his expiratory pressure, as he no longer requires a hypoxic support, and increase his inspiratory pressure to combat his rising CO2. As you can see, setting an inspiratory pressure of 15 and an expiratory pressure of 5 now produces a pressure support of 10 centimetres of water as compared to the 6 centimetres of water he was receiving previously. Well that's it in a nutshell. Remember, CPAP to treat hypoxia, BiPAP to treat hypercapnia with pressure support being the difference between the two to help decrease the work of breathing. Well, that's all from me. I'll catch you next time on Emergency Medicine Topics in one coffee. Cheers.